I'm Teresa Caraggio, and this is Third Paradigm. Today, my title is Men and Women and the Tonic Tilt. I'm continuing my series on tonic masculinity, and today looking at head jester John Carter of Postcards from Barsoom. But I want to start with a story. I was walking to the farmer's market the other day and ran into my favorite book slut. I use that term with great admiration because I can only aspire to being as indiscriminate as she is in her love of all genres, especially sci-fi. So in lieu of hello, I asked what she was reading. And it seemed like in this case, her affections were not being reciprocated. What she said was the sentence from Louise Erdrich. She said, I just get tired of how anti-white it is. I keep thinking, hey, I'm white and anti-male. There's one good male character. Can't we just like each other? So I want to be looking deeper at that question, which is, I think, an excellent one. Can't we just like each other? If you have not seen Postcards from Barsoom on Substack, it is visually sumptuous and verbally scandalous. As a provocateur par excellence, I am certain that scandal is his aim and controversy his game. So I have found some unusual common ground with John in the comments on my last episode on the Mad Hatter. We were looking at critiquing the metaphysics of veganism, at multi-ethnic nationality versus anarchism, and we had some words on words. So I suggest that you check that out. John is a very original thinker and someone who is always coming up with different angles that you can agree with or not, but they're going to make you think. So in this case, I'm looking at his article called Tonic Masculinity, which starts, For the strength of the pack is in the wolf, and the strength of the wolf is in the pack. Kipling, prophet laureate of tonic masculinity, Fools rush in where angels fear to tread, being no one's idea of angelic, I now hold forth on the masculinity question. I'm going to ask four questions that John's essay prompted for me, which are, one, is the soul of a woman different from the soul of a man? Two, John talks about sexual depolarization, Is sexuality polarized? Three, when men bond over a common goal, what should that be? And four, why can't we just like each other? John begins his essay by talking about gender dysphoria as a common malaise in the culture. As he says, We've got plenty of physically mature humans wandering about who have no real idea of what it is to be a man or a woman. Evidence, just look at them. And then he refers to an essay called The Artificial Woman, authored by, in his words, the always fascinating and ever so slightly terrifying Mega Lillywhite. Mega writes, Leftists and traditionalists alike have deconstructed the woman to her component parts and in the process missed her soul. For leftists, the woman is a concentration of estrogen in the bloodstream, a set of breasts made of silicon or otherwise, a makeup regime, and a pronoun. For traditionalists, the woman is a biological window, a number of eggs in her ovaries, an artificial womb, mammary glands to feed a child, a maid to clean the house and make food. Both movements profane the essence of a woman that has the power to inspire her humanity. And then Mega quotes Victor Hugo, Les Miserables, in the scene where Fantine sells her knee-length hair so that her daughter can have a wool skirt and not be naked in the cold. Mega cites this as woman for sale. 
Yet the part that Fantine sells is an ornament, whereas the part that she keeps, the part that will do anything for her daughter, is her soul. John writes, As the old saying has it, women are born, men are made. The distinction isn't as pure as that, but there's an essential truth in it. Even in the absence of good guidance and saturated with terrible advice, a lot of females will sort of muddle through and figure out more or less how to become a woman through sheer instinct, if nothing else. Males need to be shown the way towards becoming men. They need to be molded and tested by other men. They need to be torn down and built up, terrorized and encouraged, bullied and banced. The word soul comes from the Gothic Siwala that means a drop returning to the sea. I don't think that there's a difference between the drops that fall into the bodies of men or the bodies of women or individuals at all for that matter. But I think in terms of the role that we play within this body, that there is something that makes a woman be born again when she gives birth, that she's born again as a mother when her heart leaves her body and starts operating outside of it. It's the scariest love that you can ever feel because you don't have a choice in it. It controls you and it never lets go. I think that for men, they have a choice to love or not to love. They can not even know that they have a child because they have the kind of relationships that aren't. And there's a way that a man can walk away once from a child or walk away several times a day. It's also a humbling experience because there is nowhere to hide from reality. And Every judgment that you've harbored against other people, I guarantee you will come back to haunt you in your own kids. So embracing that path to manhood is something where I think that Charles Eisenstein and Dr. Hammer are exemplars. But it goes beyond that because we're living in an era where Motherhood itself has been denigrated and turned into something that you do on the side while you are doing your primary purpose in life of serving the market and making the rich richer. Every time that a mother walks away from a baby or from a child, there is a whole world that collapses. And changing that and finding a way that people can once again be able to raise families and have that be the primary activity for both men and women. That's, I think, the job that's before us. Now let's look at the polarity of sexuality. My earliest memory of being aware that dichotomies were not was in third grade when a visiting priest talked about free will versus predestination, but I'll save that for another time. The next time it came up was a college exam, a personality test, which might have been the Myers-Briggs, and I just found out that was actually written by a mother and a daughter. So in that, I got really stuck on this idea of introvert-extrovert because I felt like I was both pretty extreme at the same time, but I was not anything in the middle. So as a myopic kid, I walked around with my nose in a book and a chip on my shoulder against the popular kids. In high school, I got cast in the role of this Greenwich Village bopper, and I decided to just stay in that role, to stay in character throughout the rest of high school. And that meant that I worked at being an extrovert. I learned how to do it. And I think because I considered it work, I became a little better at it than someone who expected it to be fun. 
Certainly it didn't make me popular, <laughs> but it put me in that ball game. I think that masculine and feminine is the same, where it's not two poles of one continuum, that it's two different continuums that intersect. If we look at masculine as being the masculine side of the brain with rationality and literalism and linear thinking, that the extreme of that would be termed autism. If we look at the feminine side as imagery and symbolism and being in that eternal present, that the extreme of that is schizophrenia. Neither one of those is useful on its own, even within the same person. If you saw my episode on Imagination Seeks Attention, I talk about the TED Talk of Jill Bolte-Taylor called My Stroke of Insight. In that, as a neuroanatomist, she has a stroke on the left side of her brain and is able to see what happens from the inside. And she realizes that she's in this place where everything's beautiful and she feels at one with everything and she's at peace and it's expansive and then the left side kicks back in and says, we've got a problem. We need to figure this out. We need to get help. And she describes the laborious process of comparing shapes to try to figure out a coworker's phone number only to discover that she's forgotten language and talks like a golden retriever. So in that, help does arrive and she goes through months of rehabilitation, but believes that accessing that right side of the brain through meditation is something that is essential for world peace. And then bringing that back to the left side where it induces action and where there are ways of making plans to make that a reality. So I think that Within ourselves, masculine, feminine, and the tonic form of that only happens on the diagonal, which is where the tonic tilt comes in. That in order to become more of a tonic man or a tonic woman, you need to keep stepping with both feet. You need to keep making sure that you're progressing with both sides of the brain and that you're passing things back and forth and having that linear thinking of how do we analyze this? How do we break it down in a way that we can move forward? And what's the goal? What's our intuition about what's important in life? And to that, I think a mother's perspective is key. John writes, Male groups function best when they serve as vehicles for the direction of their members' collective will to power. They need to be directed at making real, consequential changes in the world in such a fashion as to directly improve both the members' lives and the lives of those they care about. The key element is that the group is organized around a project, and the project is something that will raise the status of members by improving the lives of people in their community, ideally by bringing something new into those lives that they didn't previously have access to. The whole self-improvement angle of tonic masculinity is a subset of goal-directed activities you want your bros to be fit, strong, and sharp because that makes all of you fitter, stronger, and sharper and thereby makes the goal, any goal, easier to achieve. What is a goal worthy of these fitter, stronger, sharper, titanic men, not to be confused with titanic? Saving the world is the only project that comes to mind. Forget skinning Bambi or becoming one with the wolf pack. Those are just a means to an end, as John points out. But there are numbers to crunch and algorithms to write, as unsexy as that might seem. There is a vampire squid of a global economy that needs to be cut down to sushi size, and they are the right men for the job. My book awaits. 
I started my post with my friend's question, can't we just like each other? Is it possible for us to just admire and appreciate the people who are different than us, whether that's other cultures and ethnicities or genders? In the battle of the sexes, can we lay down our arms and snuggle into someone else's? Does someone have to lose in order for someone else to win? In the book, The Dawn of Everything, by David Graeber and David Wengro, they talk about schismogenesis, which is the tendency of neighboring tribes to have differentiated from each other. And when I respond to Dr. Hammer, I will be talking about that from my experience in raising three girls, that tendency to push away from the others. I think that that's something that comes up in anthropology from them. What the Davids say is that in every culture, the main indicator of what a boy is, is not a girl. And what a girl is, is not a boy. That they tend to define themselves in ways that differentiate. I think that maturity is getting over that. That the masculine and the feminine are the right and the left foot of the body. And if you're only using one, you're just going to go in circles. In conclusion, I've struggled with whether John's essay is a very witty and erudite form of bros before hoes, a word that John uses more freely than I would prefer, which is not at all. I think that it's for women to reinvent words like slut and whore, but they should be off limits for men in the same way the N-word is for whites. Just my opinion, and it might get me voted off the island. As the contrarian of political correctness, John is bringing up topics that deserve to be considered, and he's doing it in a way that is so smart and quick-witted and making these bizarre connections that deserve to be considered. If you have an offendable bone in your body, check it at the gate at Barsoom. And if you're easily offended, don't even land. But if you want to check out an entirely foreign terrain of an original and untamed mind, enter at your own risk. The cyber wolf is friendlier than you might think and likes to be scratched behind the ears. I'll be continuing this series with William Hunter Duncan, who writes Born on the Fourth of July and his essays Sacred Masculine and Second Christmas. In the meantime, check out Jill Bolte Taylor in Imagination Seeks Attention and also to continue the theme of imagination and also reinventing the world, here's the utopian imagination on Naomi Klein. Thank you for watching and join the conversation at Substack.